Okay, so we're going to talk about the Constitution and the Federalist Papers um, for this chapter, and we're going to kind of apply our knowledge of the Constitution um, to some more current events, and so hopefully you'll be able to see how the different branches of government interact here. Um, in terms of the overall constitutional structure, Article 1 starts out by describing um, Congress and the powers of Congress, and then Article 2 um, proceeds to describe the office of president and what that, um, what the president can do and what the powers of the president are and so on and so forth. And then Article 3 describes the judiciary. And then after that we have 27 amendments that have been done to the Constitution, the first 10 of which is no shock to you is, is referred to as the Bill of Rights. So um, the Constitution itself is, is not incredibly lengthy. Um, we do have a number of laws that have then been um, passed underneath the, the different branches of Congress and approved, um, and then the Constitution itself has been flushed out in court cases, um, and then we've had you know, situations that we'll get to later in the class where Congress has given authority to bureaucracies to write rules. And so the, the overall Constitution itself has changed quite a bit over the years, but the basic structure is still there. Um, it's not real lengthy, and therefore we've added a lot of extra law that we'll get to later in the class that seeks to flush out exactly what the relationships are between these different branches um, and how that authority works in our government. So looking into the Constitution, it's always um, easier, I think, to learn about something when you kind of have some concrete examples to work from. So uh, today we look at congressional military our congressional authorization for military strikes in Iraq, Syria, or Ukraine. Um, now, Iraq with ISIS is probably the most uh, likely one, and it's probably the most one on the radar screen. Syria, probably less so, although when the chemical weapons issue had popped up last year, that was a, a live issue, whether we were going to bomb in Syria or not, uh, given the use of chemical weapons by the Assad regime against his citizens. And then Ukraine, that's obviously um, Putin's excursion with Russian troops into the Ukraine and um, trying to take over uh, eastern Ukraine. So what I'd like you to do is review Article 1 and Article 2. And then in your discussion groups, I want you to write down and identify the war powers for both the Congress and the President. So your dis discussion um, groups within the discussion groups I want you to write down and identify those powers and I want each person to do that and then also to answer the question in what ways do these powers serve as a check on one another so I want to see that in each one of the discussion groups all right uh, the different ways that the war powers of identify the war powers of Congress and the president and then whether or not those powers serve as a check and that you're looking at the Constitution to do that so um, you look at the Constitution, look in Article 1, Article 2 to see um, powers related to war authorization, and then identify those, and then see if those serve as a check on each other. All right, so we're going to next look at one of the documents I loaded up for you, which was the 1973 War Powers Act. And I want you to read that and then look on and see if you can identify within that act uh, what parts of the Constitution does the act rely upon and clarify. What do you think this law was reaction to? And then notice that Richard Nixon vetoed that and why would he have sought to do that? And do you still think there are ways around this? So we'll take a quick look here and we'll take a look at the War Powers Act. Okay, so this is the War Powers Act of 1973. Um, as, as you can see there on the first page, it was um, passed over Congress's veto. And in the narrative, too, there, it, it shows that there was fairly, um, fairly kind of open idea about 
what the um, powers of the president were and were they limited what when the, if the commander in chief has authority to um, bring us to war and has authority over the military but congress has the power to declare war how do those things interact right they come to a head during the korean war conflict where uh, president truman had taken us to the korean war based on the u.n uh, resolutions rather than an act of congress and so we were just coming off of Vietnam, which is still fresh in everybody's mind. And um, so this was passed largely in reaction to a, a lot of what was going on in, in Vietnam. So when we look back at that last question, uh, what do you think this law was a reaction to? Remember, in 1968 and later 60s, um, all the way up until this point, we had been in Vietnam. And given that that was an unpopular war, um, many in the out there had, including in the Congress, were seeking to have a little bit more say in when the United States went to war. Okay, <clears throat> so as we look down through here, um, as you can look at the purpose and policy, it's the purpose of this joint resolution to fulfill the intent of the framers of the Constitution and ensure that the collective judgment of both the Congress and the president will apply to the introduction of U U.S. armed forces into hostilities or in a, an involvement where hostilities is clearly indicated by the circumstances. Okay, looking back here, where does it come in? Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution provided that Congress shall have the power to make all laws necessary and proper, so they sort of, uh, cite to that part of the Constitution. Um, they, we then move on to the constitutional powers of the president as commander-in-chief to introduce the United States armed forces into hostilities or into situations um, where it's clearly indicated by the circumstances are ex exercised only to pursuant to a declaration of war or specific statutory authorization or a national emergency. Okay, um, so that's what they're trying to create um, is that this is the purpose. We're trying to create a method for how the, the president brings us into war with the consultation of Congress, okay? So in the absence of a declaration of war, uh, at any time when the U.S. armed forces are introduced into hostilities, right, the limit, um, the president has to inform the Congress and then is limited to a 60-day um, period in which the president can apply force um, without any cons congressional approval, okay? Um, so if you look down here, <clears throat> if this is within 60 days after the report of the president submitted, uh, the president shall terminate any use of armed forces with respect to which support was uh, submitted unless the Congress has declared war and extended the period by another 60-day period or is physically un unable to meet because of an armed attack, right? So it's a 60-day period. Um, and it shall be extended for not more than an additional 30 days if the president determines and certifies the Congress in writing that um, it's an unavoidable military necessity, okay? Um, so 60 days is kind of the important uh, period of time here. And so um, we look back through here, and that's really the gist of the joint resolution, okay? Um, And here we'd say, well, it's not intended to alter um, treaties or anything like that or impact congressional constitutional authority. Okay, so looking back at our slide, why would Nixon want to veto, to veto this? Well, obviously, um, if Nixon uh, felt like this was a reduction of his presidential power in any way, Almost any president would then have been interested in vetoing, vetoing this act. And the question then is, well, are there still ways around this? And currently, with ISIS, um, President Obama has pointed back to um, the congressional authorizations for the original war in Iraq by President Bush and said this is a valid extension of that um, authority. So that was the initial position of President Obama. Since then, in the last... Um, Kind of the the last policy position of the of the administration is that no, in fact, we'd rather have 
um, Congress go ahead and approve that. And so here we see um, President Obama had <clears throat> initially um, proposed to get congressional approval of military force. This article is from the Atlantic, dated um, April 15th, 2015. Um, and it looks like the Congress is not in any kind of mood to approve it. They they feel like the White House proposal is, has limited the authority beyond what they think he should have. Um, but it seems like it's it's a little bit of politics between both sides here. Okay. Um, the whole exercise, this is the funny part, the whole exercise is bordered on the absurd. A quick recap. The administration has argued all along that it doesn't actually need a new authorization for war because the 2001 and 2003 resolutions, remember this is when President um, George W. Bush was in office, <clears throat> that Congress repassed and never repealed, allow for military action against ISIS as a terrorist group that branched off from al-Qaeda in Iraq. So everyone recognizes now that ISIS is no longer part of al-Qaeda, and those original ones were, were related to groups um, in support of al-Qaeda. So there's always been a question about We'll do these earlier laws that justified the and gave the president authority to go in Iraq. Does that now reach to um, this this business against ISIS? Okay. Um, the AUM authorization of use of military force. So that's what the AUMF acronym means. Okay. So they think that the AUMF um, proposed by Obama recently to get congressional approval against ISIS actually provides them with less authority than the existing war resolutions they passed in the wake of September 11th. Okay, um, and so this is kind of where we're at now. There's not been any kind of congressional authorization of this specific action against ISIS. We're pointing back to the earlier laws passed in 2001 and 2003, um, and um, it doesn't look like we're going to get any kind of congressional authorization for it. So where does that leave us? Well, I think it leaves us pointing back to those original 2001 and 2003 resolutions as justifying it, because certainly um, under what we just looked at here, right, the president has 60 days um, when he introduces it without declaring war. We have not declared war on ISIS or anything like that, um, and then it can only be extended for another 60-day period. Um, and so this shows you that there still are ways around this, right? Um, there are ways of interpreting that statute that allows the president to still carry war out and carry introduce U.S. troops into hostilities. And this, it, it again, proves that laws, no matter how well they're written, can't solve every problem. Okay. Now we're going to look at a letter from President Obama for the justifying the use of force in Libya. So back in 2011, remember that we sent U.S. troops into Libya to help the Libyans uh, beat back Muammar Gaddafi. And here's an example of the 60-day deal under the War Powers Act. So this is an actual letter from President Obama to the Senate indicating that he's exercised his um um, authority under the War Powers Act, okay? Um, and again, we've got a new citation here, right? We're citing to efforts of the United Nations, UN Security Council, um, all those kind of things, right? UN Security Resolutions, um, and it's it's stating that, well, on the basis of these UN Security Council resol resolutions, um, Muammar Gaddafi, who was the head of Libya at that time, has since been was killed, and Libya was Gaddafi's regime in Libya was overthrown. Um, and this goes through all of the the stuff that Gaddafi has done to violate the UN Security Council forces. All right, um, and so the United States does not deploy did not deploy ground forces. They provided air support, um, but still, just providing air air support, the uh, president notified Congress that they're using American force, and therefore the 60-day clock starts running as of the date of that letter, right? Um, if there had been an extension of that, then um, 
we would have gone farther. So um, it's just another an example of the 60 days in action. All right. So on what basis did Obama justify the use of force in Libya? Um, used unit, primarily UN Security Council resolutions, right? But also his authority on as commander in chief. So when you look back here, um, we're, we're primarily citing to UN Security Council's resolutions, um, but this is clearly an, an example of his use of the War Powers Act, right? Okay. What's different about Iraq, Syria, or Ukraine? Well, we just talked about what's different about Iraq. In Syria, the political situation is much more complicated um, in that uh, China and Russia are not big fans of us overthrowing Assad. The groups fighting against Assad <clears throat> are somewhat aligned with ISIS. And so the question of are we supporting ISIS when we go against Assad? Is Assad helping us by fighting ISIS? It's, it's a bit of a mess in Syria. And then what's different about Ukraine, obviously Russia, and we have a lot of other big prominent players there. Um, and so well, the question is, why would the president seek congressional authority for Syria or congressional authority to fight ISIS but didn't for Libya? It's because the political consequences of the Libya action were fairly limited at the time, okay? Whereas the president would like buy-in from Congress if we're going to go war in Syria or escalate what we're doing against ISIS, the president wants Congress to also be involved in that for political cover, because then blame can be put on both the Congress and the president for any kind of bad things that would happen as a result of that. All right, so let's look back at the 2003 resolution here. And look at what that looks like. So this is George George W. Bush's um, authorization to use United States Armed Forces against Iraq. And again, we go through all the sins of Saddam Hussein and the, the Iraqi um, government that he ran, right? So again, we see United Nations violations um, as a justification for going to war. Um, Congress had passed previous laws um, stating that Iraq was a problem. Um, and we see, um, again, a citation to Al-Qaeda. They're known to be in Iraq. Um, all these things are trying to tie in um, issues that Iraq had done with the UN Security Council, um, tying in with Al-Qaeda and other violations saying, well, if we don't hold them accountable for this, um, previous statements by the Congress, um, previous acts by the Congress. And you see just the whole list of things here that the president had done, um, or president cited, President George W. Bush cited in support of military use of force against Iraq, right? So this was passed, and this is partly what's now being used um, to justify the war against ISIS, too, which also happens to be in Iraq, right? So here's part of acting pursuant to this is consistent with the United States and other countries to continue to take necessary actions against international terrorists, terrorist organizations, including those nation organizations or persons who planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that turned, took place on September 11, right? So the, the argument of the Obama um, administration is that ISIS was one of those who, who aided the terrorist attacks and aided al-Qaeda at the time, therefore we can go after them under this resolution. Um, here's the specific, specific citation to the War Powers Act, right? The War Powers is intended to speci provide specific um, authorization within, within the meaning of 5B of the War Powers Resolution, okay? And again, here's the President shall at least once every 60 days submit a report to Congress. And so again, going back to the War Powers Act, so we're looking at 5B, okay? And there we have it, right? There's the 60-day um, period. Specific 
um, statutory authorization for the president to use armed forces. Okay. Section 5. Unless the Congress has one declared war or has enacted specific authorization for the use of the United States Armed Forces. So, the question is what do you think would be different if, in a resolution authorizing the use of force in Syria or another resolution in ISIS or authorizing, authorizing uh, force in Ukraine? Obviously, we're going to have UN citations for Syria's use of chemical weapons. We'll probably have some similar Al-Qaeda language and terrorist organizations that would be cited in any kind of authorization uh, related to Iraq. And then also um, any resolution for utilizing force in Ukraine. Okay. Um, and then what statutory constitutional authorities? We saw the War Powers Act. We saw UN Security Council. We saw previous laws passed by Congress. Okay. And so the question is, do United Nations resolutions give authority for the president to use force? Okay. And you saw in the letter to Libya, or letter to the Congress regarding Libya, that President Obama was saying, well, all these violations justify our use of force here. Okay. And there's two different takes on that that I've given you. One is uh, Louis Fisher's uh, interpretation of um, President Truman's authorization to go into the Korean War and the uh, the punchline from all this is to say President Truman unilaterally did not have the authority um, to go into war um, just based on UN, UN agreements he needed to have congressional declaration or authorization for the war okay so um, looking down here you can go to Conclusion, President, or President Truman's unilateral loose use of armed force in Korea violated the U.S. Constitution and the U.N. Participation Act. It's not valid for precedent for what President Bush planned to do in Iraq. This is the first president in the first um, war in Iraq with President H.W. Bush, George H.W. Bush. Nor is it a valid precedent for military option, operations launched by President Clinton in Bosnia or Haiti or other U.N. peacekeeping options. Um, so... This is one person's opinion that says, no, that's not, that's not valid. But if you look at um, President Clinton's own lawyer at the time, right, um, proposing to, to deploy UN's, UN troops into Bosnia, it's not surprising that President Clinton's um, own counsel in 1995 concludes, actually, UN, UN resolutions do provide it, and they have in the past, right? And so there are all kind of citations. Um, to that kind of stuff in in the the Dellinger opinion, which is the opinion to um, the president that no, in fact, UN resolutions. Um, here we go. Here's the punchline. We believe that the president has authority to order proposed deployment of United States forces into Bosnia without expressed statutory authorization, given the UN violations. Right. So. Um, we look in the, and these are going to be important things to remember for your test and be able to answer these questions, right? Um, what role does Fisher see for the United Nations? Um, it's important, but it doesn't authorize the use of force, right? What do you think Fisher would say about the use of force in Libya or in Iraq? Uh, the overall opinion would be um, UN, UN resolutions by, in and of themselves, do not justify the use of force, right? Um, any use of force needs to have congressional approval, according to Fisher. Not surprisingly, Dellinger has a different opinion, right? And it's not not the same opinion. And think about who he works for, right? He works for the president, and therefore um, would be seeking to um, back up the president, presumably. So what's really going on here is it a bit of a power struggle between the con the Congress and the president over who gets to um, have authority to go into war. And for sticky situations like ISIS and other ones, um, there's going to be a situation where nobody wants that wants that responsibility. And certainly you'll see the Congress try to back, back out of that. Okay. So, this is for next time. Having read what we read about the importance of treaties, UN resolutions, 
I want you to talk to identify the treaty powers of the Congress and the president, and then write a way that these powers can serve as a check on each other as well. Okay, so just finishing up the uh, War Powers Resolution, here is the actual uh, resolution that President Obama has sent to uh, Congress that, that doesn't appear that they are going to act on. Um, and again, here you can see um, citations to the various um, activities that ISIS, or ISIL as it says in here, um, has done, genocide, uh, violations of different things like that, threatened, threatened threats to the United States um, and its partners in NATO and North Africa and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, and then President Obama asked for congressional authorization of military action against ISIL. Um, and here, again, we see war powers resolution requirements. Consistent with the War Powers Act, Congress declares this section is to constitute specific statutory authorization within the meaning of 5B, which is what we saw um, for the prior and prior authorizations that we looked at um, as well. So um, this is the current one that hasn't been acted on, um, but this is the draft from President Obama and um, seeks congressional authority that's not been acted on. So they're continuing to point back to the earlier um, actions from Congress um, back here, um, authorization for use of military force of 2002. That's what they're pointing to. That's the one we just looked at for Iraq. That's what they're, they'll have to point to as authorization for this action um, if they don't ever get to passing specific authority against ISIL. So that is the actual joint resolution that's pending uh, before Congress, but Congress probably will not act on it.